So I'm Liz um, and the founder of Aurorasaurus. So I think we've talked on, you know, Twitter and we, we know a few folks um, from the science community uh, in common. Um, and I'm yeah. really happy to have uh, folks here today who want to talk about your book. And I'm happy um, to introduce uh, Laura Brandt, who's the Aurorasaurus project manager. And she's going to introduce you to the group. We're just having introductions all around. So I am, I'm Laura, as uh, Liz said. And everybody, I would like to introduce Melanie Windridge. She is a plasma physicist, speaker, and writer with a taste for adventure. Uh, she has a PhD in fusion energy from Imperial College London, is communications and self and energy, and has worked. Oops, wait, it's a bit. Sorry, I made it go wrong. No, That's you're okay. fine. It you're, works perfectly. I now. think you're okay now. We're good. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry you're about a that. Communications consultant for uh, fusion startup Tokamak Energy, and you've worked in education with um, the Ogden Trust, which is a UK-based charitable trust that exists to promote the teaching and learning of physics, um, the Welsh Science Education Organization on Tourists, um, the Your Life uh, campaign, which is to inspire young people in the UK to study math and physics, and uh, you are a STEM ambassador in the UK as well, which is very, very cool. Um, and you are the author of Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights, which we have been reading, um, as well as a book called Star Chambers, which is an uh, introduction to fusion energy. Um, Melanie also loves the mountains and believes science and exploration go hand in hand, and she has climbed Mount Everest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all great things, um, exciting things here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we really... Uh, like the book about auroras. It's really cool to me that there's a book about auroras. Um, I think your background in not aurora science, but plasma physics um, probably helps you really um, communicate uh, and bridge some of the gaps of communication here. So maybe you could just kind of give us a brief overview of the book and your process writing it. Um, oh, okay, well, um, so the book itself is I would say like it's a narrative um, journey of discovery, if you like, uh, into the Northern Lights. So I really went, like you say, I wasn't an Aurora scientist um, to start with. I'm a plasma physicist, which was really useful because it meant that I could, I could talk to physicists on their level uh, and then I could be the one who had to like translate it, if you like, or bring it down to a general audience. They could just talk to me about the physics. So I think that was really useful. Um, but I didn't want to just talk about the physics. I wanted to really find out about the stories of the Aurora and uh, the people who are out there. Because I think what's interesting about the Aurora is that it's, it's in, it happens in these rings around the poles. So it's very constrained. Uh, in terms of locality, really. Um, and so I think that there's a real landscape link there. It usually only happens in, you know, towards the polar regions. And so there are things like polar exploration. And I was fascinated by what explorers would have thought about seeing something like the Northern Lights when, at the time, science couldn't even explain it. And so I really wanted to go off on this investigation and I wanted to find out about the people, the places, the landscapes and the stories of the aurora um, and sort of weave that in with the plasma physics and the science and so yeah that, that, that's what I did and it was for me personally it was an extraordinary journey as well. It wasn't all in one go, I did it over about two or three years doing like you know a few trips in the in the summer and then in the winter and then the summer and then the winter so it was good. That's Great. I actually also, I get to follow in your footsteps and go to Blatchford Lake and Yellowknife in about a week or two. So that'll be one. Also. Amazing. That'd be great. And gather new places to see Aurora. Yeah. Uh, so one um, more question. Sorry, then I'll turn yeah. it over. Yeah, right. um, what to you do you think is the biggest challenge in communicating Aurora science and, and the biggest opportunity as well? Ooh, okay. So, um, I suppose it goes for a lot of science communication, actually, that it's really complicated. And so it's the, you know, the bringing it down to make it accessible to other people, um, but still being kind of true to the actual science that's the challenge. So you, it's, it's the, the trick is kind of knowing what to include and what to leave out. 
because as scientists we can be very particular about oh yeah but I have to say that oh and then I have to say that and I have to say that because otherwise the story's not quite right but then if you've lost people they've got none of that so you kind of need to figure out yeah what you can leave out and still stay true to the story and I think that can be a big challenge like the aurora <laughs> as I'm sure you know you know people think of it just like this little pretty light show that's happening in the upper atmosphere and you know the basic description is charged particles coming in from the sun and that's not the whole story there's this huge picture out there and even in my book I, I mean I, I cover quite a lot of it but I left out loads <laughs> because it was just too high level um, but even then people members of the general public say oh my god there's so much plasma physics um, and there is because as a plasma physicist I wanted to include things like that so yeah that, the big challenge is yeah what do you leave out <laughs> and what do you keep to make this accessible to to people who don't have a scientific background um, yeah. so the lost her hopefully we'll get her back um i was thinking about the cool. the magnetosphere is oh, oh you're back we oh, well, hello. Hello. sorry i saw it froze where did you where did i where did you lose me uh just a minute ago but i, I think um you know the magnetosphere and the myth of the sun directly causing the aurora is definitely something I want to keep working on, take out billboards about, and I don't know, there's, there's many different, um, uh, there's work and your book definitely helps with that. Um, yeah. I also want to mention, we have several people from different museum and informal education uh, groups on the phone. Um, NASA has a really nice group called the Solar System Ambassadors and people do volunteer outreach and they help do um, some of that job. So it's really great. Um, and uh, a student um, as well. So we're all we're all students, but we're all learning here. Um, would you like to yeah. go, go next? I was gonna say, um, one of the things that I really appreciated most and uh, that talking with everyone we've, we've appreciated as a group is your use of metaphor um, to describe these very, very complex processes. Um, and one of the things that, that I was wondering is, um, since the book came out, have you thought of any other really awesome metaphors uh, <laughs> to use explaining Aurora science that you just wish you could squeeze in there or that you would like to share with us? Uh, you know what, I, I had to think about this and I don't think I have got any um, new ones to explain the science. However, I do, I did think when I saw the Aurora, um, actually a couple of years ago at Blatchford Lake Lodge, in fact, uh, I saw quite a lot of movement. I was lucky. Uh, in my, when I was writing my book, I actually didn't see a lot of movement in the Aurora displays that I saw. It was only afterwards. You, you've got to keep going. You've got to keep yeah, on going. That's true. Um, but one, what I thought about the, like the structure or the shape of the Aurora is that sometimes when it gets really uh, dynamic and you start seeing a lot of movement, it does this sort of ripply thing um, where the rays that are going upwards sort of uh, like pulse, if you like, like in and out, like da -da 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 -da. and it really reminds me of a piano. If you run your fingers along the keys and go, da -da 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 -da, you know what I mean? So it's not a metaphor of the science as such, but that's sort of the only one that I can think of that's come out after the book, because I only actually saw that happen after the book was published. That's cool. cool. That, <clears throat> that would be really memorable yeah. for, uh, you know, helps <laughs> this communicate as well. And also like <clears throat> it, um, it's a different type of sensing and so it's more memorable too. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, you're good. Mm. Um, so as you wrote the book and sort of tested out ways of communicating all of this complex science, um, were there any science communication angles that didn't work as well? And this question is from Genevieve, uh, who's also on the line. Okay, um, yeah, that's an interesting one as well. I feel like a little bit ex exposed uh, being asked that question because like, I don't feel like I tested things enough. I just wrote it. <laughs> I did. Um, it was a lot of those metaphors that you mentioned, like they came to me when I was writing and so I was thinking and I was at my desk and, you know, thinking, how would I explain this? So they didn't really get tested out beforehand, if you like. However, there is one thing um, that I did sort of try in talks, which I've since abandoned. Um, and that is, I had this strange idea. So it's to do with 
You know, um, so in the atmosphere, the reason that you get the different colours of the aurora is when the electron, the incoming electron comes in and it essentially knocks an electron out of its orbit to a different higher energy level. And then, so the, the atom is now excited. And when the electron drops back down, it releases that extra energy as light. Um, and that light is, depending on which energy level it had gone to and which atom you were in, you know, how much energy it had extra, that determines the color of the aurora that you get. And so I was trying to think of a way to explain this for school students. And I actually had made, um, in collaboration with somebody at the Fusion Lab actually that I work with, so I spoke to him about what I was thinking. And he made this little demo for me, which was like, you know, in the old fairgrounds, you used to get those super striker things and you hit it really hard with a hammer and the little thing goes up to the top. And if you get it far enough, it goes ding. Yeah. So I think it kind of reminded me a bit of that because it's like if the incoming electron bang doesn't have enough energy, then you don't get the auroral color. It just sort of nothing really yeah. happens. You have to have enough incoming energy to knock out an electron and, uh, and, and start this whole thing. So I actually made myself a little kind of Aurora super striker, if you like, <laughs> and with different amounts of energy, you could, um, it would, it would, it had little LEDs, so it would flash different colors depending on how much energy you had. And you eat, there was even a timing setting. If you flicked it onto like hard mode or something, there was a timing setting where um, just probabilistically, if, you know, it could, you could fizzle out, you could just have a thermal collision and lose the energy of the atom without getting the auroral color emitted, which gets much more complicated. Anyway, I ditched that. <laughs> it never really, it, it was an okay concept, I think, but it just requires so much explanation to kind of get it, so for people to understand what you meant, that it sort of defeated the object. See what I mean? So yeah, I did try that and failed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my life's dream is to have like several different pieces of like a Rube Goldberg kind of thing that all works together and explains Aurora. But you need <laughs> this piece and you need that piece and you need some physics and all this stuff. So, um, well, yeah, you. I can lend it to you one day when you've got the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, we, it, it takes all of us here. We can do it on this call, I'm pretty sure. Um, okay, so I have to ask you if you've tried citizen science and um, what you might think of that. I haven't done it myself, but I think it's really cool, particularly uh, well, the kind of thing that Aurorasaurus does and others uh, with where, where things like the in, in advances in camera technology are making it possible for amateur enthusiasts to really contribute to scientific research just because you know, they're out there all the time. In fact, when I was writing Aurora, I met a lot of either auroral physicists or magnetospheric physicists or people who study the aurora who hardly ever saw it because they don't live in the right zone. And conversely, you've got lots of people who do live in the right zone, who are seeing it all the time, and they have a really great understanding of the patterns and the structures of the aurora if, if they're going out a lot. And particularly if they're photographers, they can capture so much detail, which is like, so you could be so useful uh, for the scientific community. So I think that it's really great to see how, how that has sort of changed in recent years, if you like. And a similar thing, I'm a member of the Cloud Appreciation Society as well. So <laughs> and that kind of came through Aurora and basically looking up at the sky. But they've done something similar because they have a lot of members who are just interested in the sky and taking photographs of clouds. And they got a whole new cloud type or cloud species recognized by the World Meteorological Organization for the same kind of reason. Enough people took pictures of it and then they said, we don't know what this cloud is. A bit like Steve, you know, it's like, we've seen this thing mm -hmm. and we don't know what it is. And so maybe it's something new and then you go and you research it a, a bit more and it, it turns out that yeah, it is some, something new. So yeah, although I'm not out there doing it myself, I have a great appreciation for it because I think it's really interesting how how amateur enthusiasts can contribute to research like that. You were talking a little bit about photography and I know um, Lynn has a question for you about a picture in your book. Okay. Hi, I'm Lynn. I live in Bozeman, Montana. Hi. Um, so in the book, you have a picture that you took of the Aurora and you said, this is the best so far. Yeah. 
have you been able to take another one that you could replace in the book? And was it better because you've learned to use your camera better and take better pictures? Or was it better because the Aurora was more dynamic for you? Good question. And the answer is both of those things. So when I was writing the book, um, I didn't see any, an amazing Aurora with, with lots of movement and, you know, but I did see, I did see good Aurora with like nice green arcs and I saw some rays. So it wasn't that I hadn't seen Aurora. I had seen decent Aurora that would have made good pictures, but I couldn't photograph them properly for various reasons. Um, one of those was that I didn't even have a good enough camera. I mean, I did have one where I could set the exposure, which is the most important thing. I wasn't trying to do it with my iPhone or anything, but I didn't have a proper SLR camera. So, so that was one thing that, that made it more difficult. Having the right equipment is obviously very important. Secondly, I didn't really try that hard because the whole time I was writing the book, I just used to say, like, I'm not a photographer. I want to just experience it. I, I want to, I'm more interested in the writing. So I'm going to talk to people and I'm going to experience the Aurora and I'm going to write about it. I'm not going to be too preoccupied with trying to get the best photograph. So I didn't really try to get great pictures of the Aurora. And the third thing was, I generally um, was seeing the Aurora in very uncomfortable situations, you could say, um, like particularly skiing across Svalbard and things like that. I do remember, I, I have one picture of the Aurora in Svalbard. I really wanted to see the Aurora in a wilderness environment in the way that the old polar explorers would have done. And what you don't realize is that when you're actually there, your priorities completely change because it was so hard living in that environment. The temperatures went down to almost minus 40. And so it's a huge struggle just to get out of the tent. No, really, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Like I went all that way and then I, I didn't want to get out of the tent because it was so cold. So when, the, when, when we did finally see the Aurora, I went outside for about 10 minutes. I, tried, I took one photograph and then my battery died on my camera. And so I just wasn't set up right for it, if you like. I was, we, were, we were camping and dragging all our stuff in, in pulks behind us, so we couldn't keep the batteries warm and ugh, everything was hard. Since then, I've been to nice lodges, cozy, warm places like Blatchford Lake, where you can keep your camera equipment warm. If you get too cold, you can go inside. <laughs> you can carry your tripod around. Like I didn't even carry good equipment because when you're doing things like skiing, the weight is so important and you leave everything behind. Uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was a mixture of things. Mostly it was just my ineptitude when it, when it comes to photography and with a bit more practice and more comfortable surroundings, I was able to get much better photographs. We have um, been collaborating with this group of women mountaineers in Svalbard um, on an expedition called Hearts in the Ice. Oh, yeah, so they are so far from civilization. Um, they're seeing like 24 hour Aurora, but Ooh. also, you know, it's, it's hard to get outside, but they've really done some extraordinary, um, they're so keen to participate in citizen science that they've um, actually captured observations during a rocket flight from Svalbard as well. And they just wow. threw everything on and, and got outside and, and really captured it. So that was really cool too. Yeah, um, amazing their modern day explorers as well but yes uh yeah so we say after after all of these amazing experiences what questions do you still have about aurora oh that's an interesting one um i suppose it's always nice just to see how things evolve because i mean the field evolves because yeah, it's science we don't know everything I, I said at the end of the book even that you know, there are still mysteries. It's not like it's all solved. And that's one of the misconceptions I think about, about the way that science is portrayed to tourists because they get told like how the Aurora works. And actually, as I said, like a lot of, I think I said, um, sometimes, you know, they, they miss out that vital piece of the puzzle, which is um, acceleration. And they just talk about things coming in directly. So essentially their description is like a hundred years ago, as opposed to now, they don't talk about how things, what we still don't understand and how our knowledge is increasing all the time. And of course there are, there are new uh, missions, for example, like solar orbiters launching like 
this week or something, isn't it? Like at the weekend, if it goes to plan. Um, and then we'll be able to get even closer to the sun and, and learn even more about the plasma and the things that are driving space weather and, and the aurora. So I think it's just interesting to keep up with with what's happening and how our understanding is improving like day by day because we don't we don't know everything and also something that's quite interesting that I, I don't know much about um is how much or if there the interaction between the aurora high up in the atmosphere and the weather much lower in the atmosphere like that's as far as i'm aware more like kind of an open question and sometimes people do ask about that or I remember the reindeer herder, I think I mentioned this in my book, saying, oh yeah, you know, we always see different colours when the weather's changing. And I'm kind of interested as to whether some of those old myths are actually based on anything, if we can find out scientifically that there's a reason. So yeah, I mean, I think just, just keeping up with the state of knowledge uh, is interesting. I don't have any particular burning questions, but it's just good to, it's just good to learn more about it as, as we go along. Yeah, there was a new uh, citizen science discovery just in the last week or two about yeah, the, dunes. the dunes, yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. which is cool too. And, pr and not totally new, has been seen, but not understood. So um, maybe uh, Ray, would you like to ask uh, one of your questions? Yes, uh, I'm kind of more interested in the science aspect of it. Uh, in my outreach, I try to communicate science to a wide range of uh, age groups so i try to give them the the true science but in a simple way to to be clear and one of the things i discuss is radiation exposure in deep space travel and um i talk about coronal mass ejections but um the thing that people can relate to is the aurora they know what that is and i try to uh, connect the two but i'm not sure is there a clear connection between the coronal mass ejections and auroras, or is it more from just the solar winds? Hello? You're there. Hi, sorry, I missed the last bit of the question. You said the thing that, and I... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you got the build up and not the question, okay? The, um, the question, or the, the question I have is, is there a direct connection between the coronal mass ejections and the aurora, or is the auroras more developed mostly from the just the pure solar winds, the plasma continually coming off the sun? Ah, good question. Um, both, actually. So, so the solar wind, the, like the, the basic solar wind, if you like, that's streaming away from the sun all the time, uh, does drive the aurora. So you will see, um, just like let's say low level or reasonable aurora, they call it a substorm. Um, just yeah, that will that will happen because of the normal ordinary solar wind. When you get a coronal mass ejection, it's like this is supercharged or something. You can get like much more aurora um, if if the coronal mass ejection hits the Earth. That is, if it if it gets if if it's if the matter that the sun throws out hits the Earth's magnetic field, um, then it sort of stimulates it a lot more. It's, it's pumping huge amounts of energy into the magnetosphere. And so you can get these, uh, the regular pattern that you see, the substorm pattern that you see, sometimes gets sort of clouded out, if you like, because there's so much activity. Um, so you just get a lot more movement, you get a lot more color, you can see the aurora a lot further south, while well, the northern lights further south, southern lights further north, close to the equator. Um, so yeah, there, the coronal mass ejections definitely do um, make a difference to the aurora that we see on Earth and you get much bigger, brighter displays. Yeah. And, and can you speak to a little bit about the uh, protection that the magnetic field of the Earth provides? Yeah, so the, um, as you mentioned about the, the radiation, if, if an astronaut, let's say, was out um, in space, then uh, that the, the charged particles that are coming in could be very damaging. It, it disrupts um, DNA at the cellular level and things like that. Um, and so, but as far as the Earth is concerned, um, the magnetic field sort of prevents the solar wind from coming in and getting close to the Earth. It sort of deflects the solar wind around it, a little bit like a, a rock in a stream. Uh, but actually it's more like a bubble than a rock because it's you know, a, a cavity, um, it's this open space. 
in inside the magnetic inside the solar wind. So the solar wind kind of gets deflected around it, and and the the tail, the back of the magnetic field, gets stretched out away from the Earth like a sort of wind sock, and. Uh, and, and so this, this magnetic field just stops the solar wind from getting down to Earth. And we still get particles coming into the atmosphere, as we all know, because that's what's causing the aurora. Uh, but it's, let's say, a more controlled way um, of these particles getting in, uh, because the, the magnetic field essentially absorbs all that energy that the solar wind is bringing with it. Um, and it dissipates that energy by these, uh, well, some of it, I think we don't even know where some of it goes, but some of the energy is dissipated by accelerating electrons into the atmosphere and that's causing the aurora. Um, but I, I believe that, um, maybe Liz can tell you, I believe that there's actually like, much more energy out there that's dissipated. Some of it's dissipated as heat as well. So the magnetic field is sort of preventing all that energy from hitting us on Earth. So very, very relative, little, excuse me, relatively little gets to the surface of the Earth, even at the poles, from uh, even a coronal mass ejection, but even the solar winds. Yes. What is, um, you do need to be careful, uh, or the airlines have to be careful during coronal mass ejections, because uh, there will, the radiation dose in, from flying will be higher when there's a coronal mass ejection, because there'll be more particles um, coming into, or charged particles coming into uh, the atmosphere at the levels that the um, aeroplanes will fly. So often they have to be diverted, so they're not going over the poles, so they keep out of, of the way. Um, but I think down on Earth, it, yeah, it doesn't, the radiation doesn't reach us down on the surface. Thank you so much. Um, I was gonna put out the, the floor. I know, Shauna, you had a bunch of questions to ask as well. Um, Ask your number one. Yeah, ask your number one if you would. Um, Sean is at the Smithsonian Museum of Air and Space um, and gets a lot of questions about Aurora from visitors. Okay. Hi, Melanie. It's a real honor to meet you and talk to you. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm an, an astronomy educator. I have a huge amount of respect for science communication and that balance we were talking about. Um, we're usually observing the sun. People ask about solar flares and CMEs and the Aurora. And um, I'm one of the things that we yeah, the most I think is just how do you best explain what causes them and how, like, if there's a best time to see them and if the cause affects how you would want to go look for them? Hmm, okay. Lots of questions <laughs> kind of in there. Um, so let's start with the first bit. How would I, you mean, how would I explain what causes the aurora? Yeah. So, really basically, um, if I would telling somebody about the aurora, I would say that it's, um, it's a light show, if you like, that occurs in the polar regions, and it's caused by charged particles that are accelerated into our upper atmosphere. And then I could, I, accelerated is the key word for me, because that's what's always missed out, um, and that bothers me, <laughs> that people leave out acceleration. Um, and then if I were to go into a little bit more detail, I'd say that the sun is always throwing off um, charged particles, mostly protons and electrons, which is something that we call the solar wind. And this wind, well, all of the planets sit in this solar wind, but so essentially the wind hits the earth, um, but we're protected as we were talking about just earlier with this other question by the magnetic field. And I would usually say on, on a simple way, I would say that, yeah, the, the solar wind kind of, hits the Earth's magnetic field and it sort of energizes it. It almost sets it ringing like a bell. And, uh, and then that energy accelerates charged particles that are in that environment down into the atmosphere. And when they hit against, when these electrons coming into the atmosphere hit against oxygen and nitrogen, it causes them to emit light. Then you can always go deeper. So if people are receptive, then you can start talking about magnetic reconnection and the cycle that's set up and they'll start asking about oh but why you know can I see the aurora all the time and you have to sort of say no it's to do with the magnetic field in the solar wind and the magnetosphere and how these are matching up and you know it has to be southwards to actually set this cycle running and but that's a lot more complicated so you I always start you know 
on the very basic side, if you like, and, and kind of build it up slowly because you never know like how receptive they're going to be. What was the next bit of your question? <laughs> uh, I think the other most common one we get is just, is there a best time of year to see them? Do, do they change over the course of the year? Yeah, that's an interesting one as well. And I get a lot of these kind of questions when I'm giving talks and that kind of thing. And so I actually, I started a blog called Aurora Stories where I address some of these things. I mean, sometimes I also share people's stories because I found that as a speaker, people, it's really lovely actually. It's a really nice part of the job if you like. People come up to me after talks and tell me when, about their experiences and when they saw the Aurora and that's really lovely. But anyway, I also get these kind of questions. And so I said, I, I've addressed them on the blog in, in various ways. I think generally people, people do say that the equinoxes can be a good time to see the aurora and that's to do with the tilt of the earth and the magnetic fields that we were just talking about um, i think there's just more chance of the magnetic field of the solar wind pointing south relative to the earth's magnetic field um, at the equinox time so you've got more chance of of it being um geo effective as they <laughs> would say um and getting an aurora display however different people say different things like the reindeer herder that I met in Norway he said um I, I went I visited in March and he said you should have come here earlier in the winter when it was colder you see better aurora when it's colder now I think that's to do with the cloud cover so when it's colder it's clearer and so you've got more chance of seeing the northern lights um so different things come into it and I always say to people if you want to go and see the aurora and you want to maximize your chances then you, you can think of it one of two ways. If you know exactly where you want to go, but you don't mind when, then look at the weather for that place and figure out when, when the skies are clearest, I mean, in the, in the dark time of year um, for, that, uh, for that location. Or other way around, if you don't mind where you go, but you particularly want to go at a certain period of time, then look where the weather is clearest at that period of time around the Aurora Zone countries and go there. And otherwise, if you want to go to a particular place at a particular time, just go for as long as possible and, uh, and maximize your chances that way. Because a lot of the time it comes down to, well, the weather being clear and then just what, what the sun's doing. And they're both just chance. So you just have to wait, like just go and camp out there for a bit and wait and see. So we're uh, getting close to the end. Uh, Kristen, Jeremy, Jeff, Faith, and Genevieve, do you guys have any final burning questions for Melanie? No questions, but I just want to say thank you so much for, um, for sharing all the information. Thank mm -hmm. you. I think we Bye. have one question to conclude with. And Melanie, what do you think is the most important takeaway that everyone on this call can share with their communities about Aurora's and Aurora Science? Ah, this I'm going to be really boring again and say that like, I think that the most important thing is the acceleration. I think that it's the biggest misconception. People, people miss it. And somehow we need to, I don't know, get journalists or, um, you know, local Aurora guides or travel specialists to understand that, that the, it's not just the geeky sciencey Thing. it's actually a fundamental part of what is causing the aurora and it's not just direct particles from the sun that to me is, is a really important thing but i know that's the the geeky sciencey bit of me talking because travelers don't care they're just like oh particles in the atmosphere right that <laughs> that is that enough uh, so but i would say but that's like how you communicate i would say the most important thing is it's so great to just get out there and and do it um, and it's and it's two way engagement. Like I've gained so much through doing this. I was very humbled when I was writing it, or particularly after I was writing it, that people gave me so much of their time and their energy and their friendship and all of these things when I was writing the book. Because I just wrote to people and said, "Hey, I'm writing a book. Can you tell me a little bit about you know whatever their specialism was in terms of the aurora?" And, and people helped me out for no reason other than we had a shared interest. And, and that's a really wonderful, humbling thing. And, and since that, I've met so many other people who have that same shared interest. And I feel that my life has been very much enriched by all of these connections. And so I'd say, yeah, the most important thing is just go out there. And it, it takes a bit of yourself. You have to open yourself up 
to that as well but I think you get so much back from it too. Definitely and the citizen science community has been an Aurora enthusiast community is just phenomenal mm -hmm. so it's so great mm -hmm. to have people uh, sharing and asking questions and kind of trying to bridge some of those gaps. So um, I, we'd be delighted to, you know, put your blog post, highlight the blogs mm -hmm. as well. So um, especially if there are any particular ones that you think, oh, I have already answered that or that just to share more about it um, would be great. And maybe there's ways our blogs can uh, um, collaborate as well. So yeah, that'd um, be great. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, this is great. Um, we're gonna um, share the call and thank you for allowing that. Uh, I know I actually think I wanna rewatch it and I've learned something. Um, and it's been, you really have a, a great gift for um, communicating this and sharing the enthusiasm uh, as well, um, all of it. So, so it's <laughs> so, so nice to talk to you. Um, and me too. Yeah. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. And thank you everybody for attending as well. Yes, thank you all for taking the time and um, picking up the book. <laughs>